we will move on to the next Raghav Jubilee lecture. This lecture will be chaired by Nitya Rao, Professor, University of East Anglia, Norwich. And this lecture will be delivered by YK Alak, Chancellor, Central University of Gujarat. The topic for this lecture is Managing Rivers, the National Water Framework Law. Can I please request the chairperson as well as the speaker to please come on stage. Session Chairman and former <coughs> Chairman, both of us are there now. Uh, my friends in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was very happy when I learned that later on during the meeting, you are going to discuss rivers in Bihar and Jharkhand. Because I think uh, there is a major event that has taken place which has gone largely unnoticed. And I'm not quite sure if many of you have uh, even noticed it, which is that the Sadhvi, I will say which Sadhvi, we have a number of them, who is the Water Resources Minister of India, has presented an act in Parliament called the National Water Framework Law. Uh, we are a very unruly people. We don't like laws and we hate frameworks. But uh, she has had the courage. And the rivers are deeply contentious issues in India. Fortunately, you are discussing the rivers within Bihar. But the rivers within Bihar are a part of a much larger system. And so I think this legislation, which has now been introduced in Parliament, called the National Water Framework Law, is important. Many of you have worked on water. And uh, so I thought I would give the reasons why I think it is important. And I hope you will have some time, you will have some time, because you are discussing rivers only later on in this meeting to reflect on this and perhaps give what you want to say on this issue in this meeting, which I hope will then be discussed. I'm sure this will go to a select committee on parliament and I would recommend to Saibal that if there are conclusions from this meeting, you should go and meet them and if you want some of us to join, we will be quite happy to do so and later on in the discussions that take place. Now, this law, as you know, or some of you may have heard, has been presented in Parliament in March 2017. That was the time when we were having very acrimonious state elections, and this event 
went almost unnoticed. There were not, not that many people who even saw it. But behind it are many compulsions. There is a great need of integrating water resources management with agroclimatic regimes. Now, I say agroclimatic regimes and then I duck because water people think in terms of watersheds and agroclimatic regimes are different from watersheds. But they overlay each other. And in the days when we had planning, which we don't have now, and yet that mindset continues because we go back to those concepts, even when we develop things partially. The agroclimatic regime was superimposed on the watershed. Bihar has three such regimes. It's a part of central Bihar is the Ganga alluvial agroclimatic regime. North Bihar is a part of the flood prone regimes and the mountains and South Bihar of course the great resource region, agroclimatic region of India. Now the great rivers that you are talking about transcend their watersheds, transcend these regimes. And it will be of some interest to me as to how you handle this in the discussion on rivers that you are going to have. The framework law does it in a very simple manner. It says that these have to, the first beginning of the management of a river has to be at the local community with community-based institutions. The framework law itself calls them CBOs. And they begin with the management, which is very important in Bihar incidentally, the management of ponds, watersheds, and aquifers. First the local aquifer, and then they build up to higher spatial levels leading ultimately to the river basin. Now, Tushar Shah, who is a fellow airman, has always criticized me for talking about water bodies and watersheds and aquifers when starting from a local community level, which is the way the national framework law, those of you who read it because it's available now, builds up to higher spatial levels. It then builds up to higher level watersheds and then the river as a whole as a watershed. <laughs> now this will mean integrating water with soil and climate. Even though the river people always talk in terms of watersheds. I think it's a kind of logical question which we used to ask when we were doing planning. We don't anymore, so I think with that these logical questions also go away. And yet I think policies remain. So should we begin with agriculture? and integrate it with the river basin, which is the way the agroclimatic planners do, or start with the river basin and relate with agriculture, which is what the water specialists do, and which is what the National Water Framework Law does. Most planners would begin integrating planning with estimating priority demands 
And then there are issues of pricing and so on, which is also there in the water framework law. And the water framework law does accept that there will be, it's a great movement towards using markets in water. And there has been uh, the Frenchman Coulet has criticized the National Water Framework Law of India on that count. Uh, I'm not quite sure because the law does talk about priority to markets. It is interesting that, you know, we've had that whole discussion on poverty and I've lost Jerry somewhere, so he's there. And many of people like him have been involved in it. And yet the whole question of water need has never come in that discussion. It's always been food, but not water. That a minimum amount of water has to be there is there in the water framework law. And it has been criticized because people say it's very little. And it's very interesting that in spite of all the discussion on the requirement of grains, for example, and the Falcon Mark Index, which as many of you know, is the index of the minimum per capita requirement per person for water per year. Uh, the water for essential consumption has never been defined. There is the need of water, but that includes, of course, bathing, which is a real need, but it also includes animals, the water that we may need for washing a bullock, and so on. And this is one area in which the definitions are very unclear, and I think the parliamentary debate will get into it, and I'm not, and I'd be very happy to see how you handle that question when you handle these two rivers in Bihar towards the end of uh, this discussion. The framework law, I think, is in the context of a dual economy. It does provide for water to be supplied by the state and rationing, but it also provides for the market. My impression from what I've read of, because it's available on the internet now, now that it is a, a law which has been put in Parliament, is that this is a question which is left a little vague. And I think if you can consider it, what is the minimal need for life-giving water? I had said 25 liters per person. And I was pilloried. 250. In the original water framework legislation, there is a committee which I chair, which is more or less put in the act. There, the 25 liters was going to be the right of every Indian, enforceable by law. I may be 1,200 meters above in the Himalayas, but you have to give me 25 liters of water. I may be in the Thar Desert between Barmer and Jodhpur, but you have to deliver 25 liters of water to me. The committee that I chaired deliberately kept it low. It said this is the minimum, not that you don't provide more than that. For this, even the market is not an excuse. For the rest, the market can be there. Then, the, the water framework law has something which will warm the cockles of the heart of those people who are participating in the discussion on, on rivers. It talks about integrated water studies and technology and resource assessments. And the big thing is 
which is perhaps the only thing that, you know, one of the critiques that Kule had given of the original water resource in Bangalore is that it's much too centralized. It in fact is not. And neither is uh, the Minister of Water, Minister of Water Resources in Water Framework Law. The only place where it provides for the central government to play a definitive role is the minimal requirement of every Indian for water. And they've left that. They haven't defined it. So that's going to be done between now in the parliamentary committees and later. So it's an important question. I wish we would discuss it. Then the only other thing, there are only two other things that the government of India is supposed to do in the water framework law. It's in fact a law for the center, the states and local bodies. The only other thing that the government of India is meant to do is to build up a water resources information system, which is basically data. Now data on water and rivers is a very acrimonious business in India because people give wrong information for purposes of planning. And uh, this is well known, I mean, it's not something. And we have independent sources of information on river flows. And that generally tends to <coughs> be different from what the state governments give out. So here, I think the framework law, in asking for a commonly ex accepted water resources information system is going to push the country into a direction in which it is up to now not gone. I mean the flows of the Kaveri, for example, on which I was once asked to chair a committee, is a highly contentious issue between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, both at the point, well, at all three points, where the Kaveri originates, at the point where it gets into Tamil Nadu, and then of course in the Tanjore Delta. So these are not not debatable questions, but as you said, I have to be brief, Chair, and so I'll just leave it at that, and then if there's discussion, I'll be, we'll get into it. The water framework law also tends to suggest that if all of this is done, they use the more water will be available. So what does that mean? I think it means something. It's almost a philosophical concept. At one level, more water cannot be available. But at another level, there is synergy in these things. And what they're really saying is, that if those synergies are captured, then for use at least more water will be available. Will additional water be available? Question mark additional. Uh, it will be, as Shakespeare said, a question that the wit said. Now, should we make these policies in agroclimatic regimes or river basins. Water projects are all done in watersheds and basins. The Chota watershed, the Bada watershed, the whole river as a basin. But flagship development programs, the Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yosna, which, uh, surprise, surprise, is still there. I thought planning was dead. But still there. That said, the state agricultural plan, that is the Rashtriya Krishi Vikas, the agriculture development plan, the big central scheme, has to be based on initial district plans, subject to reasonable resources from its own plan. And we add from the center the additional money that is required to meet the objectives of rounded development of that region. Keeping in view sustainable management, I, I'm now reading from the, the Krishi Vikas Yojana planning <coughs> work. 
management of natural resources and technological possibilities in each agroclimatic region. This then should determine each district's final resource envelope, their production plan, and the associated input plan. Now, the 12th plan brought in community groups, NGOs, cooperatives into this. And then farmer-led distribution systems in existing ones. Watershed management. Rehabilitation is very important in the state like we have. Rehabilitation of tanks, fields, ponds, talabs, aquifer management, particularly in the areas around rivers, which have high returns. But actually, water projects and agriculture projects, in fact, work in silos. Convergence would have very high returns. But now, of course, convergence is impossible because even planning has been abolished. Now, all of this is very well dealt with in Jal Manthan 2, which is organized by our present Desadvi Water Resources Minister, where the National Water Framework Law was presented by the Central Water Commission. And you might like to get that, it's easily thought of. Or can we begin with another approach, which is that we start with the watershed basin at the lowest level, perhaps two or three talukas, and then integrate with agroclimatic regimes. In Bihar, as you know, we have about four agroclimatic regimes. So, in both the rivers that you are studying, what is the approach that you would recommend? <coughs> and in my print, unfortunately, Unlike the committee on which it is based, there are only one and a half paras in the law. And I think if you go Saibal, to the parliamentary select committee, we have to say, why only one para? Even as a framework law, I mean, I can expect a parliamentary committee and the law, a law is not a place where you put in a PhD thesis. Yet it has to be more than one para if it has to have any operative sequence. The framework law does give, the original report does give a structure, not one para, it's a page and a half. This one para business is almost a slate of hand. Now, all this action will never be harmonious. There will be conflicts and disputes. And that is the place where the central government does have an actual role to play. And the framework law, apart from the water resources information system, gives them only a place in conflict with them. <laughs> and then again, there's one thing in the law, and you get all kinds of funny statements. I mean, three days after that, you get a saying that there's going to be a super tribunal, and there are going to be branch tribunals for every river. And the framework law saying something else. And who is looking into the consistency of all of this? We have abolished planning, but we can't abolish common sense. I had suggested when I did the recovery business, either got sized down, down less, or we're going to release waters very differently if they were already built from the ones that we had originally designed. But how does that system work? So that system works at three levels. At the first level, You have people like me and others, the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. So they try to resolve the system. 
At the second level, you have uh, Babas given the Asiatic feudal traditions, government officials, what would be roughly speaking the chief secretaries and chief ministers. And at the highest level, you have a political system, which in their case is the vice premiers of the Mekong country, countries. And in the recovery business, I suggested the prime minister and the chief ministers of the two states. That was accepted by Narasimha Rao. What he talked about only was the water that is said in that year should be released, because that was required by the Supreme Court. And it's really interesting. There has been, in about eight years since then, there has been conflict. But there has not been a single year when the flows didn't go. So you develop systems which lead to a maximal level of accepted unhappiness. But the system functions. It is this year that that system is with the city again. We have no answer it. In this year, the system is. And this year, the Prime Minister refused to meet the Chief Minister. So it is a political decision that the system will work for 8 to 10 years because Karnataka said that will the Prime Minister arbitrate as he has every year. And uh, Tamil Nadu accepted that when Madam was alive. I don't know what they say now. But <coughs> now, there's a lot in the framework law of it in improving irrigation efficiencies on canal systems. Who is going to do it? How? They have said community-based institutions. But at larger levels, they have to be state-level agencies. <coughs> Planning Commission studies have shown that in, even in canal modernization schemes, when farmers are encouraged to man manage canal systems, even then, the irrigation authority generally kept the powers to themselves. It's only in the few cases when, together with the management responsibility, resources were also transferred, that things improved. Now, they do say that China is managing these systems in a much better way than we do.
because I believe we are running late and we still have one more speaker before dinner. So if anybody has, yes, there's a gentleman. Sir, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just have one uh, slight query about the National Water Framework Law. Uh, there is a provision for PPP mode, Public-Private Partnership mode of uh, distribution and from the SIP from service to a distribution model. So there were, again, uh, maybe an issue of uh, survival of the fittest may come in again into the water distribution system. So this is one of the queries which I want to be clear. And the other part is about uh, uh, managing at a community level. So in places like Bihar, uh, there has been system which has been working very fine with the community management uh, uh, module of uh, distribution of the waters and conservation of the waters and utilization of the waters, even in the uh, dry areas. So uh, isn't it like uh, strengthening them further would, uh, would be something that we should be looking at a policy framework for a, a state like Bihar where water is actually a problem? Thank you. Uh, Steve. Steve. Uh, I have one question. One question is about when half the river basin is in another country like Nepal for the Kosi River Basin. Is there any provision in the law about those situations? Yeah, and that's the final question, yes. This is uh, to this day. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, very good presentation. I, I don't have any questions, but I have a few, few points to share. Actually, you can brief. Yeah, yeah, very, very briefly. I saw you presented uh, a situation where the, the, you have, you are facing water space. Uh, we have to look, at, actually water projects are multi-purpose projects. And you have to probably design the project in such a way that the needs are scattered on the one side. And on the other side, you have to consider a river. It's not an entity for any economic development. It's, it's a living being. So consider river as a living being. The third point I want to stress is that, uh, well, India, especially Bihar, is very water stressed. In monsoon, it's stressed because of the floods. And in just of the, in the, in the, of the year, it's just because there is not sufficient water. So multi-purpose projects are very welcome. The fourth point I wanted to stress is that in India, the problem is uh, data scarcity. Either there is no data or there are too many data. It's the same thing. So it's, it's very important to have one data. The fifth point I wanted to share was the importance of groundwater replenishment. The groundwater in this region is depleting very fast and it's becoming more and more scarce. So that needs to be, and the last point I wanted to uh, conclude with is the difference between center and northeast. I'm not from northeast, I'm from Nepal. But at the same time, I have visited north, northeast many times and the way the center is planning hydro projects in the northeast that gives them um, gives them to believe that there is northeast and there is center and the center has to act to make feel inequality thank you thank you very much uh, is there another maybe you can take for two minutes what you can respond to this things we do a lot of injustice. Remember some of the earlier environmental you know the water water reservation for environment purposes used to be as look even the National Commission on Irrigation said 
10 percent. Now that is a ridiculous figure. Now we are all the time talking about 20 to 40 percent and probably the real numbers lie somewhere there, although there are people who talk about 90 percent. So I know why these are some extremely contentious issues, partly because I think definitions are not there. But I think this concept that if you keep a lot of data at one place and people work on it, you see the water resources information system, which is there in the Act, will need a certain amount of conceptual clarity. And whether Uma Bharti wants it or not, she will not put it in the Act, but somebody will have to give that clarity because otherwise those concepts don't mean anything. Second, that you know, that it becomes a law, that's a big thing. Because then you can't do the kind of thing that you're doing right now, which is that people don't give information. You know, I remember when we did the Kaveri thing, and I came back and Mr. Devagauda was Chief Minister of Karnataka. So he said, um, how did you find out about sugarcane uh, planting in North Karnataka, in the garden areas? So I said, sir, I have my sources. I didn't tell them satellite pictures. A lot of information is available. Generally, people have more percentage in writing that information rather than sharing it. So I think the water resources information system will ultimately, not in one year, Nothing happens like that. Nothing ever succeeds in India, as an American colleague of mine once told me, and I had to tell him that he's absolutely right, but nothing ever fails in India also. So I think these things will take time to work out. But uh, uh, that is there. The, I'm sorry, sir, but the water resources framework law does not get into the question of inter-country disputes at all. It gets only into the question of within-country disputes. And that is the role, that is a role of the central government. In fact, the critiques that it is providing for over centralization is wrong. The only two things that it does is one is that the dispute mechanism authority will be in the center, and that has to be by definition. Because if the states themselves are involved in the disputes, it has to be a whether it's a tribunal or whatever is a different issue. I personally prefer the Mekong kind of formulation. The, the water framework law doesn't get into that. But it has to be a, a central mechanism. And the only other thing with this centralization is that this minimal requirement of water. And there I'm very happy, even my young friend sort of went along with me conceptually. I thought I'd be murdered on that, not talking about adequate water. At least 300 liters per day per person. And here I'm saying 25 which is just about what you need to drink and maybe wash your face. But uh, I think we'll come out with norms for that also. Will the river as a living being, will it give us new concepts? I hope it does. And that's about all. And not these I don't have much to say. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Alag, and I'm sorry for having uh, rushed you a little bit towards the end. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, Professor Alag and Professor Richter. Now we'll move on to the last lecture of the day. This lecture will be delivered by Wendy Singer, Professor Kenyon College, Ohio, and chaired by Subroto K. Mitra, Director, Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore.